Hello. Yay. Today I'm going to talk about something that I'm very concerned about. Um, and it's not really that much of a technical talk. It's more about techniques and ideals and things that we, we talk about and get us excited all day long. So that's why I called it Advancing the Web Without Breaking It. I'm right now at a tour of seven conferences in six countries within 20 days. So I'm not quite sure where I am or what I am. And uh, if I'm slipping, just tick it off to that. But it's going to be OK, I think. We're living in a time of clashes at the moment on the web. Every single day, there is massive drama going on, and something is going wrong, and somebody is wrong on the internet, and other people have to tell them continually that they are. There's like native versus web. Like, oh, god, everybody has to be native. Oh, no, the web is better because it's t taking longer. And everybody on native is a bastard because they actually don't like the web. Everybody on the web is too late for technology. People are clashing every day on that. I.O. versus Node. Oh, Node is not cool anymore. Now we use I.O. instead. Virtual DOM versus DOM. DOM is slow. Never touch the DOM, ever. And then the same people use jQuery, which touches the DOM just every single second. App versus website. We don't have to be accessible. We make apps. We, we don't have to be small. We make apps. It's much easier to do these things nowadays. SAS versus CSS. CSS is not good enough. SAS is the thing you need to have. Angular versus React. Maybe another platform, whatever, something. Gulp versus Grunt versus Broccoli versus... Simon talked about that yesterday. Like, every two minutes, there's something new. Düsseldorf versus Köln, but that's an old one. <laughs> and we fight, and we discuss, and we write, and we do these internet fights every single day. I'm, I'm, I'm getting tired of opening my RSS reader or Hacker News because it's just going on and on and on. And that's quite a depiction of the effectiveness of these fights as well. But uh, as the last few years in tech talks taught me, you have to do research and you have to base your, uh, your, your points on facts and you have to back them up with a graph. So I said I'm going uh, to go with a scientific approach for that one. So I'm getting tired of this. I'm getting tired of this discussion and this fighting and this like endless talk about something that is in a pre-alpha release and might be the future or not, whereas other things get outdated and people are not using. So I took it for myself to make a graph about finding out what the correlation between the discussion and my, my frame of mind is. So Hacker News discussions, general, with the amount of comments on each of the threads, there is a correlation that the shits that I'm ready to give about them are going down. Because <laughs> these discussions always end up in the same bickering. They end up in the same like, yeah, but I use React and then it works. Oh, you shouldn't use React, you use Angular. And I'm like, seriously, do, are we so bored with our lives as developers that we're just discussing things in public and fight each other instead of just doing things together? Maybe I'm just a tainted, grumpy, and old coder. Maybe I just hate modern architecture, and I don't understand that a static website should be 37,000 files in 550 different dependencies. Maybe it's just that. But I think back in the days, we were innovators. The web was fresh. The web was new. We had no idea what we were doing. But we were actually making it work. We were using, abusing, and finding new technologies. And every discussion we had back then was about something that is in the browser or comes with the stack of the web, and not something that is relying on like five different abstractions that we wrote for ourselves and made us even more into down that rabbit hole of abstraction on abstraction on abstraction. We had no clue what browsers did. Browsers were these magical things that evil corporations put on the web to make our lives hard as web developers. We were just like, why is this thing not rendering properly? We have no idea. We used what we had, and we hacked around the problems. And that's why we came up with lots and lots of CSS and JavaScript solutions that were talked about at events like this and totally made sense. Like sliding doors, who remembers that one? The first time we had like tabs that, that got bigger and smaller depending on what the content in them was. Um, CSS sprites actually stolen from game development on other platforms. Out of a sudden, we had like a rollover that was animated without having to do like 10,000 files. It was just one file, and, and we didn't have a website where everything popped up slowly one by one, but we had like all the images in one go. Amazing. 
uh, Farner image replacement and following up every single image replacement that we did. We talked about CSS Zen Garden yesterday. In the end, it was just an image replacement technique showcase, completely inaccessible, really not that scalable and these kind of things. But we realized that we want to have beautiful text on the web, and typography wasn't there, so we used image replacements. The clear fix trick, like just not to have to know which element is floating where, and just having a clear fix after it with the generated content, and it worked. And then, of course, we had 10,000 discussions that it doesn't perform, and it does perform, and we shouldn't do this, and we shouldn't do that. We discussed as well, but at least we discussed about the things that were not changeable, which were the things that were outside of our control, which were the browsers. All of these techniques were aimed at creating user interfaces. That was the problem that we solved. How can we make the web prettier? How can we make it more understandable? How can we make it more interactive? The end product, what our end users, the people who pay our wages or pay for our wages, are actually using was the end goal of it. And I think we moved away from that. We lost that a bit, and we don't care as much anymore. Instead, we just use library and build things to just show people that what we can do. If you look at the web right now, hero image, scroll down, three things next to each other, some text, massive footer, made with love by somewhere, somewhere. <laughs> or a parallax scrolling website that wants to make you kill yourself because you're just drooling like 10 minutes after looking at it. We cared about the web as an infrastructure and a publication platform. I mean, microformats were the innovation of the web for the last 20 years that sadly enough never came, and we don't even understand that it might not be the innovation that we think it is. But we cared about it. We said, like, how can we hardwire the technologies? A link points to somewhere else, so make it a link. What else can we put in our HTML to make it richer, to make it more interesting, to make the plumbing of the web actually faster and more diverse? And now we're in the middle of an engineering takeover. Out of a sudden, all of this is gone, and nobody cares about HTML anymore because that's what React and Angular and Ember does for you. You should think about the modules that you build and your servers running in JavaScript and excitement about 60 frames per second, and like every JavaScript file has to be minified, and then we put 5 meg of image in there, but that doesn't matter because the JavaScript is small enough. So we became these, uh, the engineers that we replaced in the 90s, the people that came from mainframe development or Java developers that said, like, the web needs applets. The people we replaced, all these things came back to us because we think we are in a world where we have to compete with native applications with the web on the same level. Our web world has become much more complex. There is no denying that. Like, there's, uh, of course, CSS tricks, when you see something like that, there's Hayden, Hayden Pickering, for example, does a lot of good stuff right now with CSS that I never thought of, and I love that somebody goes down to brass tacks with that. Sarah is going to talk about SVG later on. So people are still doing that, but for most people, JavaScript has become much more than just things in the browser. We know the inner workings of browsers. We know what a frame is. We know what a repaint is. We know what, a, a, like, what the, what, a, a, what frame rate means and how, re, how, how we avoid clashes with that. We, browsers have become much more open and much more understandable for us. A lot of the web innovation happens in the open as well. A lot of the stuff is like, this is what's coming in the nearer future of browsers, and then it doesn't come, or it takes another two years for, for it to come. But we, we have insight into that. We don't have to say, we have no idea, so let's concentrate on the interfaces for our users. No, now we also want to change the browser with our technologies, not necessarily knowing how browsers have to work. JavaScript is server and client side. Node.js, almost every package that I get right now is a server inside the HTML folder that I'd have to run instead of using my Apache or something like that. And Yahoo with YUI started with that. With like, Node.js more or less came out of Yahoo, and it's great that we do it, but it, it makes you wonder if you really know everything about the client side and how to run a server just because you know JavaScript, and I doubt that everybody can do that. And with mobile, we have a fast-growing market that treats the web like a second-class citizen. And that sounds harsh, but if you are working in, in mobile web, which I guess of you, I guess, a lot do, it's just frustrating. It's frustrating how Safari doesn't get any updates. It's frustrating how operating systems are hardwired to a certain version of a browser that I cannot update. 
That's exactly what the web is not about. The whole independence of hardware and software of the web standards that we have is completely broken on the mobile, uh, on the mobile web or web technology on mobile devices because they just want to sell mobile devices and more and more companies realize that native apps bring them more money than allowing people to use this communist open thing called the web. And all of that is very exciting. Like, we have the power with JavaScript that we didn't have before. We can do amazing things with JavaScript, and we want to do them, and we want to try it out. Like, I'm, I'm big in the ES6 uh, uh, research right now with, like, all the new things that are coming into JavaScript, and I have to write a talk tomorrow for 9 o'clock at another conference about this. So there's these inspiring talks that people say technology solves everything, and I have a quote for you later. But I think the problem with it is that we, uh, that we don't demand the basic things from browsers. We're excited about WebGL. We're excited about web audio in 3D space. We want to do virtual reality in the browser. But styling a select element is not possible, and nobody cares. And nobody files bugs about this. There's basic things in HTML that are broken in every single browser out there. They're cool, new, evergreen browsers, but the, there's no demand for it because we're excited about new technology and new technology and new features. Like, oh my god, you cannot change the color of an image with a CSS filter, and that's why I can't have an app. Yeah? It's like kids when they say, like, I need light-up shoes to run faster. <laughs> to be a modern full-stack developer, you don't need to use HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. You actually need to have task runners, CSS preprocessors, package managers, MVC frameworks, unit tests, a modern development environment with live reload and 360 inspection. Oh, reloading my page after I change the file, that's far too much time. We don't have that time. Or, of course, you can use the magical framework and modern solution to everything and more of this month. <laughs> Which does all that for you. Because, oh my god, you're writing your HTML by hand? That's silly. Here is a very complex syntax that you never saw that's probably easier than HTML. And it's understandable. We have great tools and power, and we're constantly reminded that time is of the essence. If you take our technology press, they're all like, oh my god, you've got to innovate now. You've got to be out of the market first. Otherwise, you're going you're gonna to die and be in a ditch and not be happy anymore and lose your hair and all kinds of things. It's, we have to be on the bleeding edge all the time. And we've done that in the web in the past. And I think it's getting tiring, because now we have to compete with so many other platforms that also use JavaScript. And at the same time, we just want to build things. There's a great quote that I saw from uh, that I that I saw the other day, and I want you to help me or, or to guess where it came from. When you see something that is technically sweet, you go ahead and you do it, and you argue about what to do about it only after you had your technical success. I guess that's a cool thing. Like, oh god, there's a technical problem. I want to solve it, and then uh, probably there will be some technical success once I solved it. So, who here thinks that this was Sergey Brin from Google? Steve Jobs from Apple, Mark Zuckerberg, or like move fast and break things, or was it Travis Kalanick from Uber? It was actually none of them. <laughs> it was this man, J.R. Oppenheimer, and he was talking about building the atomic bomb. Of course, we learned from that. We're not blindly following technology and innovating things and not caring about the results anymore. And it would be preposterous to think that any of these white, rich, uh, intelligent, powerful men who grew up in a society where competition and personal gain is the most important thing above everything else would build something as dangerous by design or by accident as the atomic bomb. I mean, for that, they would have to have access to, I don't know, our biometric data, our step count, our heartbeat, our financial information, our health history. And of course, they would have to have access to things like um, robots and uh, drones, and they don't have, oh, wait. <laughs> Incidentally, I always find it funny when you see that the, when there's a new self-walking robot coming out, all these videos, the litmus test how good that thing is, is always somebody kicking it. You know, always like, Look, it, it, it evens itself out. This is a pretty amazing. When the robot takeover will happen, they will remember this. <laughs> we have to stop doing that. This is dangerous. I think it's a very, very bad idea. But I found this interesting because that 
blind uh, belief in technology is something that we are now actually guilty about ourselves. We have this unhealthy passion for technology. Like, this is new, it's better. But I gotta use Node.js. I saw this guy that had his wedding website and he used Redis because then he get like, like 4,500 people signing up per second. <laughs> well done. Stories of great, quick success always result in stress <laughs> and unhealthy competition. I'm tired of this red race. You know, I'm tired of people trying to to outclass each other by releasing a JavaScript library each day to actually say, oh, this is much better than the last one. And this, and I'm faster than you. My thing is smaller than yours. All these like competition that is just driving me crazy. And the press telling us that, oh, well, this, the, the market is moving. We gotta be fast. We gotta be better. We gotta be there. I like this guy better. I don't wanna play that game. You know, <laughs> This is the kind of attitude that I have towards this whole red race. I'm like, you know what? Rub yourself raw. It's totally fine. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm too old, and I've seen it too often for that. And I find it depressing that there's like 23-year-olds out there that are already burned out because they, they want to they wanna compete with each other and make each other like, feel bad because they're not as technology driven. When a company tells me that we have, we have a beer pong table and we do your clothing for you, so your washing for you, and you, you can stay in the office all night and code, that sounds like a trap to me. That doesn't sound like something I want to have. That's like, great. And if my father had overtime in the factory, he got some extra money for that. Like, okay, we all get paid well enough, but I think it's just dangerous to think that uh, there is no plan behind this, that we're not getting burned out because there was not the idea of getting us burned out. Code is everything. Everything is code. Like, well, the, nobody even talks much about the design aspect and the beauty of, of good content writing and the beauty of communicating with each other and talking to each other. And uh, everything has to be in a new technology, maybe a new language. Oh God, new languages every week. Why don't you use Go yet? Why do you use Rust? Why do you do, the, do this? And Swift is now the thing. And like, it just is interesting to see that code has been the main thing to care about. And that goes so far that governments and universities and schools are now having all these things out of a sudden, everybody has to learn to code. And I love this quote, this quote the other day. Whenever somebody tells me coding is the new literacy because computers are everywhere today, I ask them how fuel injection works. Because cars are everywhere, but I don't know how that thing works. And it's the same with computers. Computers are ubiquitous. Computers are everywhere. And now we have to learn how to do the, the, the low-level plumbing of them as normal users. I don't think that makes any sense. A lot of it, what that uh, everybody has to learn how to code means, is that both our governments and our universities have just missed the boat. They haven't realized that for 20 years we have a, a distributed system worldwide to teach people cool stuff, that they could become makers, that they could become creators, that they could become editors, that they could become critics. The web is such a wonderful gift that we have for education, and for years we treat it as like a toy that like, oh yeah, well, that's what, you know, there's like puppies there and stuff, and people buy things, and that's about what it's for. It's not as good as television or radio. And now they're trying to catch up, like, oh, everybody has to learn to code. The British government does all kind of like crazy things about, now, if you don't know how to code, you're not going to get a job. And it's the only growing market we have. Everywhere else, we have recession, and people are losing their jobs. So don't believe that the governments really, really care about teaching people how to code. They just want to show one thing that's successful while they messed up all the others. So it's time to, to say, like, wait a second, not everybody has to learn to code. Code is, to me, a brick. It's part of the process, it's part of an interface, it's part of a solution. It's not the solution. You don't start with the code. You start with the idea, you start with the problem, you find people that can actually turn this into, into interfaces that are understandable, that people appreciate, that people want to use, and then you find the right code to make that thing work, rather than just like, we code it and then we find a solution which we do now <laughs> all the time, and I do it myself. It's, it's just fascinating. And we also make advertising around it. At, on 1st of April, I released redact.js as a joke. 
because redact.js was just uh, body inner HTML equals empty string. So I said, by removing the interface from my application, it performs at 60 frames per second and very, very fast, because there's no interface to slow it down. And of course, a few people commented, a few good forks and these kind of things. And then eight days later, the PHP magazine here in Germany had it in their news, like new libraries to look out for to build mobile applications with. You know, you give it a logo, you put it on GitHub, you give it a, a, a readme and an installer, and everybody just thinks, this is already a cool solution because it's code. Yay, we make it complex, that works. Now, bricks are cool. You can build a house with it, you can break them apart, you can paint on the, on the pavement with them, you can throw them at people, and we can do the same with code. But it's not the final product, and I'm tired of everybody having to become a coder. I'm a developer. By heart, I love writing, but to me, coding was always writing. That's why it's not, it's not by accident that my Twitter name is CodePoet. I think writing and coding is the same thing to me, not finding a mathematical algorithm and then turning it into a very memory-intensive or memory-saving uh, version of a, of a function because I used the right syntax. It's building something that means something for somebody else. And I think not everybody needs to code. But people need to be empowered to create. And that's why things like WordPress are friggin' amazing. They allow my sister, for example, to make a website for the charity that she runs every Christmas where she collects presents in her hometown to give to children of parents that can't afford presents to them. She's like, oh, can you make me a website? I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> but here's a WordPress site. Read up what WordPress means. I don't want to explain it to you, but here's lots of documentation, and she remains mains her website now. She does it. That's where things like uh, uh, GeoCities were great as well. That's where services like Wix, which in German is a rather unfortunate name, uh, uh, those, those page generators actually make money. People just want to publish things on the web. And we dropped the ball on this. We really don't empower people anymore because we overcomplicate what we do. We're trying to sell people much more our things that we actually do as much more complex, because we don't want to be seen as somebody that does something that anybody could do. We want to make it more complex to tell ourselves it's going to be more important that way. I, I said that the other day, you need JavaScript to create fast, maintainable web products, like you need ducks to stop ponds from filling up with bread. And that's exactly what we're doing on the web. We're putting complexity on the web, and then we say, oh, our code has to be more complex, so we actually achieve that complexity. Like, we need this interface because I liked this tab control. Well, was the tab control the best way of accessing this problem, of solving that issue? Well, I didn't research that, but I found the thing, and now I have to use it, right? So we overcomplicate the web that in the past had been a few beautiful thing for anybody to create and care for things. It's easy to poke fun at people that had a GeoCities website. It's easy to poke fun at people that have a horrible Tumblr with their really bad poetry on it. But they care for it, and they did something, and that's better than doing a screen grab of a TV show and making it into an animated GIF and then saying, I made humor. Look at me, I'm awesome. The amount of stuff that goes from television and mainstream media into social media right now is just scaring me. We were influencing that in the past. Beta in England, the, the forum, had lots of animations and memes that later on became TV ads in England. And now it's just like, oh, look, I have a quote from, I don't know, Game of Thrones or Breaking Bad, and now you have to understand that I'm an internet person. That's awesome. No, you took something from television instead of creating something, caring for something, doing something new. We really dropped the ball on that one. We don't empower people to be creators anymore. Instead, we give them the idea that we are magical people who know really cool stuff, and everybody who starts building for the web has to learn Travis and yeah, all the things that Simon counted and, and, and explained us, what he has to use every day. We stopped like, saying, like, hey, you do these five things, you open it in a browser, look how cool that looks. I do, I do code a dojo in Sweden from time to time, which is like seven to 12 year old kids coming in with their parents and learning coding using, uh, um, using Scratch, which is a, like a puzzle piece to write code with. And then I actually start using the, uh, the stuff that we did in Mozilla uh, about writing things for the web. And it's beautiful to see kids just like messing around with a few lines in JavaScript and out of a sudden having a game on their own or changing the background color or putting their own photo inside a game 
and they're really happy doing that. And that's the kind of innovation that I want to see. The lure of the web for companies and developers is fading. The next generation of developers is not starting with the web. They're actually starting with, with mobile apps on platforms because everybody tells them that's where the money is. And that's where everything is simple because Apple gives you the SDK and all the things that you need to have. You don't need to learn everything, anything yourself. And the mobile web is terrible by now. Going on a mobile website, going on the web in a, in a browser is like how to browse the mobile web, navigate the site, close modal pop-up, decline native app offer, close top banner, close bottom banner. The app offers are the new pop-ups. We put pop-ups in browsers, pop-up blockers in browsers because they were freaking annoying. And nowadays, like, thank you for loading this website on this bad connection that you had. Do you want to download the 50 Mac app instead? Because that's obviously the better solution for it. The reason is, of course, that companies control apps. You cannot control the interface on the web. People can use things like ad blockers and can mess around with your font and stuff, whereas on the, uh, in an app, everything is controlled by you. And end users are just there to consume it and wait for the next version rather than messing around with it and extending it themselves. Despite truckloads of resources and information, we supersize the web. Scott talked about this yesterday two megabytes for, uh, for the average website. And I can't even count anymore how many, how many great resources are out there for performance, how many talks we've given about not cluttering the web and how you save bytes and how you make the thing faster. Who are these people that make these websites? It's the people who are not here. It's the people that we, for years, and I talked to every other speaker about this, we avoided. It's the people that use an oper a content management system or use a framework and just click a button because the boss tells them to build a website. It's the people that we don't reach because it's not part of our community and it, they do boring stuff. Why should I work with an insurance company? That's the, the you know? And that's why I started at Microsoft, because I want to reach these dark matter developers. I want to reach those people who are not getting invited here or don't get a ticket from their boss to come here, but clutter up the web with crap that I don't want to have. I love the web too much to allow people to use it badly. And if that means that I have to talk in another language and meet other people, I'm happy to do that. Because bandwidth is not always cheap. I just came from Albania, and that's the offer that I get from my T-Mobile in England. 12 pound for 10 megabyte for 24 hours. Or I can pay 90 pound for 100 megabyte. That's 50 web pages only for 90 pound. That's a really good investment, isn't it? And yeah, connectivity is not as good as we think it is, so don't clutter up the web with that kind of stuff. We need to change and adapt. It's great that we talk to each other about how much we love the web and how much microformance was a great idea and how much progressive enhancement works for us. But in reality, we're talking to the wrong people because the ones that are actually messing up the web or giving it a bad reputation is not us, but the other people. It's time to face some commercial facts. It's time to understand it like, yeah, my watch telling me taking a walk, go out. The commercial fact is that the web is not the cool thing to make a lot of money with anymore. We were lucky because all this random research we did in the beginning 2000s, everything was e-commerce, everything was websites, that's where the money was, that's where the growth was, so we were allowed to be in the corner and invent random stuff. Nowadays, most of the first thing that companies do is build an iOS app because it's easy to test out a market. On the web, I never know my end users. On iOS, I already know what kind of people are using my product. I already can target different markets, and I can discard it really quickly as well. Or Apple can kick me out of the market, but that's another problem. All of our best practices and ideals here are about longevity. And I'm to blame as much like everybody else. They're like, if you stick to web standards now, your website will work in 40 years' time on everything that will come out on the web in the future. It's a great message. But most people don't care nowadays anymore. We are in a world where only we care about the longevity of the web because we grew into it. For us, it's this beautiful gift of something that was not there before. Out of a sudden, we had not to learn or get a certificate to start writing code. We just put some code on the web, and it was beautiful. Whereas the new generation now, for them, the web is something that's just there. It's like opening the tap and getting water out. 
Nobody cares about the plumbing or where the water comes from as long as it tastes good. Nobody knows how to repair these things any longer. Everybody expects when I flick the switch that the light goes on, the electricity is there. The same as when I get my phone out, there's, there's connectivity and the internet is there. And you see that by what people do with the internet. They just put random stuff in there. Uh, Nikola Tesla said this, we crave for new sensations but soon become indifferent to them. The wonders of yesterday are today common occurrences. So the thing that got us excited about the web and still keeps us excited about the web is a given for the kids now that actually learn the web first thing on a mobile phone and don't even know what a desktop is anymore or use their Xbox to surf the web and do everything else there. Game console stuff, uh, using the web and that one is a big thing, especially in England. So are you ready to rock the world of Generation Selfie? This was the headline that was in TechCrunch where I gave up on life. It was like, Sean Diddy Coombs allegedly poised to invest in picture messaging app Pleek built for Generation Selfie. So somebody I cannot give a single shit about, who actually is a terrible, terrible self-made musician that moves music I don't like, maybe wanting to invest in something I don't care about for people who just take pictures of themselves and put them on the web without even putting metadata on them or describing what the image is about. And this is the money. This is where the stuff goes right now. This is where the press says, oh, this is the stuff we have to invest in. Everybody tries to get the market of teenagers and, well, if you think about it, lots of people who play games for colorful things going on to each other. This is where the money is. Timeless beauty and design. We packaged software with hardware as a consumable product and nobody complains. It drives me crazy. In the 50s, we innovated the concept of inbuilt obsolescence, where people built machines that were amazing, didn't break down, and then they realized, oh, so we only make money once with those. So let's make sure our machines break down faster so people have to buy a new one. Then we came up with the concept of fashion, like let's make the thing work, but make look outdated so people want to have a new one. And now we did the same with technology, with software, something that by definition is applying itself to an environment and is flexible. And we made it like, well, you want that game or you want to go on Periscope and be one of those cool things that videos their life and brings it to the internet? Well, you got to buy an iOS device because on Android it's not available for you. You want this kind, of, uh, this kind of content? Sorry, you're in the wrong country, because obviously the internet stops at borders. The market that we tried to innovate, that we tried to bring to people, and the beauty of like sharing and contr not controlling the web has been taken over by people who hardwire software and hardware, something that we told Microsoft of for years with Internet Explorer. And it's happening in every mobile platform, in every, like, even IoT devices have that problem. I loved when I was at Samsung uh, and they gave me this Tizen watch because they're like, oh, you worked on Firefox OS, you know about HTML5, here's a watch that runs on HTML5. I'm like, that's pretty cool. Awesome. I got an open watch, open technology. Yeah, but it only pairs with a Samsung phone. So I had to buy a Samsung phone to get the open technology to work. It's all about consumables. And everything we say is against consumables. Everything we say is like, keep it open, keep it extensible, allow other people to be part of it. So we're trying to compete in the wrong market. Let's get them young and keep them for life is what the companies do right now, like shut up and take my parents' money. Kids are spending lots of money on the internet and because they're good at annoying their parents until they say, okay, you get the game. Like, as long as you shut up, I'm, fa I'm happy. I think it's a fallacy of companies to think about that because if I think back as a teenager, I loved a lot of stuff and I hated it with a passion the day afterwards. So investing into teenagers for longevity is probably not the best plan out there, but still most of the chat systems like um, uh, uh, WhatsApp, uh, Yik Yak, Kik, whatever, that's the main market that are using them and that's where people pay billions of dollars to buy these companies just to be relevant with the teenagers right now, a very fleeting market. And for them, if we talk to them about like, oh, this is code that works in 10 years' time, uh, so? We're trying to compete with a market designed to be short-lived with ideals of longevity. And common sense should tell us that this is not necessarily the best way of doing it. So let's not try to get wound up because the mobile world is different to ours. Let's concentrate on our world. 
We are in a space where we don't have to compete with the coolest, newest technology right now. But oh my god, we have a lot of broken things that we can fix. We have a lot of terrible things out there that we can make more beautiful, better, easier to use. And instead of innovating all the time, how about we start repairing a bit of the things that we did in the past and teach the next generation to care for products rather than to do new things all the time with them. Our world is more amazing than ever. Developer tools and browsers are outstanding and give us incredible insights. Firefox now with the animation tool where I can, with, by changing a slider, I can make CSS animations and see how they work. Color pickers in our CSS tools, live editors in the browser, web audio art editors, shader editors, canvas editors. I would have killed for that stuff when I started as a web developer, when my debugging was putting an alert in there and, and putting a string out and hoping I didn't get into an endless loop and had to press enter all the time. Browsers are evergreen and offer richness we, can only dream, we only dreamt of in the past. Canvas, web audio, WebGL, CSS animations, filters. The fidelity of the, of the new browsers or the current browsers is on par with what Flash gave us in the past. We are there. We just need to be courageous enough to use it. Microsoft Edge is the end of the we need to support IEs or HTML5 is not for us argument. This is what I'm doing right now. This is what I'm, what I'm now concentrating on like, no, sorry, this excuse is over. There's a new browser coming in an evergreen operating system, and 80% of those Internet Explorer 6 and 7 visits to your websites are probably spam bots and not real users. Because if I write a spam bot, I say it's Internet 6 because nobody blocks that one. That's the best way of doing it. Services like webpagetest.org allow us to get insight into what made our product slow. We get a video of your site, what renders what, and you get like 10,000 information pieces what you can fix on the site. So there's no excuse of saying like, I didn't know. Transpiling allows us to use the next generation convenience with today's usefulness. So ES6 is not going to be in browsers, across all browsers anytime soon, but transpiling them into ES5 means you can write the very organized, very beautiful class OO driven code in JavaScript without having to worry of the browser using it because the browser gets code that executes in it. Not necessarily the best way of doing it, but you can use it right now rather than having to wait for browsers to support it. Interoperability and cross-platform tooling is another big thing. Uh, PhoneGap was that for a long, long time. Google implements Microsoft pointer events. Microsoft implements Adobe CSS blend modes. Manifold.js uh, is now a, um, there's a W3C manifest, which is just an XML file that points to your HTML application. And that way it becomes an app, much like the, 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 the app manifest on Firefox or S was, but now it's a W3 standard that will actually be supported by Microsoft and probably Google in the future as well. And Manifold allows you with an NPN JavaScript module to not only package that up for Firefox OS and Windows 10, but also create a binary app in iOS and Android from your JavaScript and HTML. And it's nuts that this is possible now. Volon.js, debugging across platforms. You can debug up to 25 devices just by putting a JavaScript in your application and then connecting with WebSockets to it. No cables necessary, just the possibility to have insight in your app from another computer by connecting it over the web. But let me take you back to something that I loved as a teenager, which is the Commodore 64. There was no question about what we can change. We could not. The thing was fixed. Like 0.98 megahertz, uh, 64K of RAM. This was the graphic specification. 160 by 200 pixel on a 320 by 200 pixel display, 16 predefined colors, one screen wide background color, three colors in each 8 by 8 or 4 by 2 pixel because it's 160 by 200, so every pixel was twice as wide as it was high. And commercial companies that saw that built things like that. That is Ultima 7 one of the screens in there in that game. That is supposed to be a, a reader or like a psychic that you talk to. It needs a bit of creativity to understand that this is that kind of person, but then it was amazing, of course, like, oh, cool game, it has different colors, look at that, pixels. Now I've got a friend in, uh, in uh, Norway who's right now with a few other friends recoding that game from scratch because reasons. She's incredibly talented and very, very dedicated. And when she showed me what she did out of that picture, without changing the platform, without changing the specifications, these are the specs. 
This is what her version looks like. And it's the same computer, same, uh, same uh, uh, 160 by 200 pixels, and so on and so forth. You also see that her version is slightly bigger because the original game was ported from Apple to Commodore 64, which had a different resolution. So instead of using the, the capabilities of the Commodore 64, they just kept the resolution to the original Apple specifications. Much like we make a native app and then we put it on the web and complain that the web doesn't have native scrolling, instead of understanding that the platform is different. There's also a, 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 a fun fair in that game. This is what the original looked like, and that is what her version looks like. And why is that? How is it possible that the same resolution, this looks much finer, this looks much more beautiful rather than seeing every single pixel. And the thing is, she learns, and we all learned about how you mix different colors to cheat our eyes into thinking that the resolution is higher. Much, much like you could do onion skinning and do a bit of blur on every frame in an animation to make it look much smoother, even if it isn't, if it isn't 50, uh, 50 frames per second, 60 frames per second. It was about much better tooling. You can now pixel on a, uh, on, a, on, a, on a PC and then convert it over to a C64 instead of having to do it with a joystick hand by hand. Experience, she had done it before and she wanted to do it again. Shared trickery and knowledge. We all shared our tricks how we actually achieve this kind of shading and like what we can do to make the thing look prettier and a lot of shits given. And this is what we missed. This is what we replaced with technology and with third-party solutions. Excellence is not innovation and implementation. Like, oh, if you use React because that's innovative and you implement it, you make an excellent web page. The formula for excellence to me is talent plus effort plus tools multiplied by shits given. And we have all of those. The only thing we have to change is the last one. The rest is all possible for all of us. Frameworks are there about the minimum viable product. This is a minimum viable product. But I want us to make minimum lovable products. I want us to aim for more and to give this passion that we had for the web that made us innovate in a space where we had no idea how browsers worked to the next generation of makers of the web rather than telling us you need these 50 tools to do it for you and then you release this beautiful big header website that everybody wants to have this month. I have this friend in Sweden who works in a company that builds uh, drum machines, and he cannot care less about the internet and stuff. And whenever we meet, uh, I'm angry about something on the web, about some company doing something bad and making millions of dollars with it. And he drives me crazy with something that I want to share with you now as well. He's the pragmatic Californian guy, came from, came from LA, was in the music business for years and years. Armenian background and just a very dry person in general. And whenever I go on a rant and I talk about how I think that like, oh, it's terrible that this company is closed and they should open the technology and stuff, his main answer is, you're angry and this is obviously annoys you, so what are you going to do about it? And this is what I want you to get away with, take away right now. I'm not saying victim blaming, I'm not saying like the web is broken because you didn't do something. What I'm saying is like, stop finding problems or solutions with everybody else all the time. What are you doing right now to change the things that annoy you? And that means being effective, being uh, progressive, doing something yourself, not going on the internet and complaining about something or to, uh, finding a solution that you don't understand but gets you 60% of the way. Find something you can give a shit about. Share it with the world after you played with it. And it has to be personal, it has to be beautiful, and it has to be you. And you know what? I started doing that. And I'm so much happier than just getting annoyed with everything that happens in the world right now. There's too many people that think putting an, a, a, a tweet out and complaining about a social problem that existed for 300 years can be solved by that, and then 10,000 people say yes or no. And I'm like, you know what? I'd rather do something myself right now in my environment to change that big problem, and maybe sooner or later the problem will go away. It's up to you to find happiness for yourself or to actually burn yourself out by trying to compete into a market we were never meant to compete in. And with that, thanks very much. Thank <laughs> you.